I have had a thousand ghosts say, well, I'm just not going. And it's like, I'm sorry, my, my presence trumps that. You will cross over. You will stop harassing this person. You will stop standing on the street corner causing accident after accident after accident. It's over. It's done right now. I couldn't function after I got a hold of that business card. And basically, because of this man, I learned about black magic. I had no idea how powerful it was, that it was a real thing, and that there were things you could do that would combat it. My husband did the most remarkable thing because he's a really good guy. He went upstairs and got a Bible that was given to him when he joined the Navy. And he got out the 23rd Psalm and he put his arms around me. And he read the 23rd Psalm over and over. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Shifting Dimensions podcast. I'm your host, Jumi Moses, and thank you so much for tuning back into the show. I have the pleasure of speaking with today, Tina Irwin. Tina is the author of eight books on metaphysics. She's studied metaphysics all her life and has gained insight into the mystical world of magic and spirituality. Her writing comes from an intense desire to know and understand the hard science behind the unseen world of action and reaction. She's also a passionate ghost helper, teaching others to help ghosts cross over. So for this episode, we're going to focus on all things related to ghosts, the paranormal, and metaphysics. Tina, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Jimmy, I am thrilled to death to be here. This is going to be so much fun. Yes, it's going to be the best time. And for those of you who might be listening on audio, you can't see what Tina's wearing right now. She's in the most amazing witch costume. She looks great. Um, this is being recorded a couple of days before Halloween. So she's in the festive uh, spirit. I wish I was dressed up myself, but <laughs> I love your costume, Tina. Um, Thank you. So I want to start off by finding out how you discovered your psychic gifts and what that experience was like for you when you first discovered it. I discovered that I had some psychic ability and I don't use the word gift because it's not like I can go back to Nordstrom's and return it. <laughs> it kind of lives within you. And I don't remember opening that on Christmas <laughs> or my birthday. So I discovered like a lot of people that I could see some things or do some things as a child. But then it, for me, it was dormant for other children. It just explodes. And I saw my my cat died and I saw her ghost for weeks and weeks when I was eight years old. And then I um I could see the the Devic kingdom when you're outside, you can see, you know, a lot of people can see the nature spirits, spirits of the trees and the flowers, especially if it's not a heavily industrialized area. When I got married, it's like all the psychic ability went into high gear. And I was commissioned an ensign in the Navy in um, February of 1973, and I met my husband a week later, and we eloped the same year in October of 73, so I've been married um, 51 years. So once I married my husband, and I remembered him from a past life, he was so familiar. That's what, that's what happens when you people say, oh, it was love at first sight. Actually, it's recognition at first. I remember you and gosh, you're the best guy. And that enabled me to have a very different comfort level with the things that, that I was discovering that I could do. And one of the, the first events, we hadn't even, I don't even think we'd been married a year and uh, he was, my husband and I both worked for the submarine force for 20, 24 years. He was in 24 years. And so, you know, I'm this very happily married ensign. It's, you know, the early days of, of early marriage. He was not at sea. I'm planting chrysanthemums at our little place in New London, Connecticut, near the submarine base. And, you know, in the cartoons, how this dark cloud comes over you and it rains. Well, I felt this dark cloud come over me and it's like, oh, somebody died. Whoa, that is the weirdest feeling. And I turned to my husband and I said, 
somebody died. And he said, what? <laughs> You're a naval officer. Work with me here. So over a period of hours, this ghost tried to take over my very being. And it was call it's the there's a term for it which is possession it's attempted possession and i reached the point i couldn't look in a mirror i was so terrified and cold oh my goodness i was freezing and i i didn't i didn't understand what was happening to me it's it's like this ghost sort of body slammed me with i want your life i want your life i'm going to kick you out like darling where did you want me to go because it's a little crowded in here with two of two you know pretty strong personalities and this went on and I'm becoming increasingly terrified and and my husband was going to be really helpful so he says why don't you make supper that will obviously help <laughs> I don't know I think it's a guy thing if we eat it'll all be better you know, will we'll, having a ghost possess you make a difference in how you cook? And while I'm making supper, he sees her face cross mine. And he realizes that he's now dealing with two women in one body. And it was very terrifying for him. And he saw it happen several times. I don't know what we ate, but we finished. And now my terror is just, it's exploding. And I feel like my whole body is turning to ice. And I did not know what you do to help a ghost. I had no idea. And so my husband did the most remarkable thing because he's a really good guy. He went upstairs and got a Bible that was given to him when he joined the Navy. And he got out the 23rd Psalm. And he, he I climbed in his lap. He's a big guy. And he put his arms around me in the sweetest, gentlest way. And he read the 23rd Psalm over and over. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And he read this with this, you know, his deep, comforting, loving voice. And she slowly but surely let go of me. And when she was gone, I knew she was gone. I could feel it. I warmed up. I could look in a mirror. And and he looked at me like, what just happened? Something astounding happened, but what was it? And that wasn't the, <laughs> wasn't the last time we would have an encounter with a ghost, but it was the it was the only time someone tried to possess me. And I realized that she died in a car accident because as she's trying to take over my body i can i'm now hearing her thoughts it's just not that they're not hidden you think you're private with your thoughts and your body but when you try to take over somebody else's body the host can hear it she was a professional young woman my age looked like me same height we were such a frequency match you know how we always talk everything is frequency you hear this all the time and it's so true well, we were a frequency match. And so she died in a car accident and she was so angry. She didn't want to die. She had a life to live. And then that moment, I realized that the dead grieve. That if she was, you know, she was 23 years old and she had a life ahead of her. And she was just horrified that she died. She didn't know what to do. And I looked like this bright light to her. So she figured, well, maybe I'll just take her body and she won't mind. I, you know, I had other, I waited a long time to have a whole life with this husband and I wanted the whole life. I didn't want a piece of it. Once she was crossed over, this was an, I mean, I'm always grateful to her for the powerful lesson she offered me. Once she was crossed over, this piece, settled on the room and i i kind of looked at my husband with new eyes as this really kind and gentle good good soul is that my husband is a good man and he didn't tell me i was crazy 
He didn't shun me or, or kind of push me aside. He had compassion for me and this ghost. Do you know how rare that is? I count my blessings every day. And after that, I learned that this wasn't going to be the last situation. And I had this cold chill really hit me. As grateful as I was that my husband helped me, he spent 40 years at sea. And I had this feeling early on that something else was going to happen and he wouldn't be there. I needed to learn what do you do in this situation? Because something about me attracted this ghost. And so I needed to get my big girl panties on and learn what to do. So that's how I learned about, <laughs> that's how I learned that I had certain abilities and that I needed to educate myself to the highest degree possible so that I could be of service to the living and the dead. Tina, that's such a powerful story. I don't even, I'm trying to gather my thoughts, right? That was so much there. I'm, I'm trying to take it all in because I mean, one, one, <laughs> to unpack it, right? There's so many layers. And I think one thing you, you, you said, I've heard you say a couple of times that you're a ghost magnet. So I think this story even speaks to potentially the genesis of that. I know you talked about seeing animal spirits and animal ghosts when you were younger, but this was your first time with like a human ghost, correct? Correct. So first of all, before we even get into that, I want to talk about you and your husband a little bit because I, I love love. And second of all, to your point about him being able to be a force of refuge in that time and not really judge you or say like, what's going on? Like, this is crazy. Is, is your husband tapped into the metaphysical and spiritual side of life as well? Is he, is he like you? Does he have that interest or did he have that interest at the time? My husband is an engineer. Mm. He is a, a submariner, a naval officer. I mean, he deliberately, you know, helped them sink the ship, not sinks, but to submerge the ships that he was on. So he is extremely left-brained. But I think what overrode that hard engineering view was he loved me. He still loves me. And he loves me with this depth that I would not lie to him about this. I couldn't make it up. And when he saw her face cross mine more than one time, he knew he had to do something. And he couldn't use an engineering solution on a spiritual problem. And I thought that that was, that was important. Now, what has happened over the years is that he has embraced the spiritual path with me, learned to listen to that voice. You can't spend 42 years at sea, because he was at sea before I met him. Countless submarine surface ship. He was the captain of an oil rig. And not have that gut feeling, that sixth sense. And with me constantly encouraging him to listen and pay attention this doesn't feel right. This isn't right. Or, you know, go double check that. He woke up one night in the middle of the night. He had this bad feeling. He woke up, raced to the engine compartment. They had atomized fuel in the engine compartment of this uh, of this um, research ship he was captain of. One spark, and there wouldn't have even been a cell to bury. You know, you know, 45, 50 men would have just, and I think there were a few women on board, would have evaporated. But something woke him up and it apparently woke up the engineer and they raced down the passageway to the engine compartment, carefully shut the engines down and scrubbed it, repaired the hole. And he can, you know, after working with the submarine force for 20 years and developing a deep and abiding appreciation for these men and their feeling the ship. You have to feel your ship. You have to sense when there's something wrong because it's not like there's portholes on a submarine. You can't see. You have to know your crew, know your ship, know your equipment. And then you have to listen to something else. I have, I kept countless stories 
psychic stories of what happens to men when they listen or or this voice warns them and how it how it has saved lives that will you know will go unknown except for me telling about it and i think that those things are important so he is a spiritual man who loves he he loves me he loves the family he he, he actually had crew members want to jump ship to be on his ship because it was a safer ship they didn't know that i always packed the ship with angels and i would remote view the ship and clear it and make sure there was nothing on toward and i did it every day he was at sea so it was a much safer ship or if i sensed something i could send him a an um i could either physically call him or send him an email and say i'm warning you about this and then he could take a different path so for my to my husband's credit he does listen he does pay attention but even for him some of the stuff that i ended up learning how to do is just bizarre so of course, of that's, course. The, that's the reality so okay so you said that when you were possessed right at that time you had the woman inside of you your husband got the bible and read psalm 23 right? And then after she left, you had this feeling that you would have to potentially deal with similar things in the future and your husband wouldn't be there. So you knew that you had to start to study and figure out what this is and, and why it happened to you. So can you talk about that path? What did you start to study? What what gifts or um, skills did you start to tap into from a psychic perspective in order to kind of understand what happened to you and how to not find yourself in that situation moving forward? I think that's a really good question because, and I, I really appreciate your asking it because a lot of people think that if you have psychic ability, all this great and mighty information just descends and you're all knowing. And that is not true. You're an ordinary mortal with an unusual ability that kind of comes and goes. You're hearing things that you can't explain to somebody else. I was, um, when I was in college, I lived in Colombia, South America. I lived in Medellin. And I was on a, we went to this crazy rock in the middle of nowhere in the Andes mountains called El Peñol and the drive back through the little switchback roads, which have no guardrails and could just wash away was beyond terrifying. And, and as I, and I'm thinking, we're going to die tonight. <laughs> what am I going to do about this? And every time we made a curve, it got worse and worse. I thought we're going to, we're going to end up in Medellin we're going to start flying off this mountain. I got to do something. But I, and I heard this voice say to me, you better stop this car because you're not supposed to die tonight. You have too much to do. It was as clear as day. You have too much to do. Stop the car, stop the car. So I, I was pretty fluent in Spanish. So I stopped the car. I got them to stop the car. They got out and no one knew we had a flat tire. So I was the hero. They changed the tire. The guy I was dating at the time, so good looking. <laughs> the guy I was dating was not drunk and he drove us because so not only did we have a fat, flat tire, but the driver was drunk. So we got a new tire and a, a sober driver and we made it down the mountain. And I never forgot that voice, that voice. It's like, it's always there. It's as if, okay, you have this ability, but we're going to give you someone to help guide you. Even, even then you have to perform due diligence. Is this, a, is, is this true? Is this a, a good being? Is this a bad, you know, who is this? And that's one of the hardest things that anyone with psychic ability has to understand. You have to be able to have discernment. And so along the way you learn are, is what you're being told for your greatest good or the greatest good of others. Is this going to do harm? And if this is the situation um, that you, you have to pay attention to what's happening, then you have to learn to trust yourself. And part of that path is if you think you hear something, you kind of learn to build up these logic trails. Does this make sense? 
have you heard it more than once? How does this feel? And this information can come to you in a dream. It can come in a waking dream. It can come in a sense. It can come as you're driving in traffic. And as you're driving, you realize everybody has psychic ability. You can't drive a car without being psychic. You just, you just know that guy's going to change lanes or you know she's just not paying attention. And you move appropriately accordingly because that voice that is, that subtle voice is guiding and warning you. Um, when we were still living in New London, uh, my husband was about to go to sea and he was going to miss Christmas. And he kept talking about, I'm going to go Christmas shopping for you. This is, you know, one of the last weekends at home. And, and when he said that, from that point on, I started having a dream every night about this horrendous car accident. And night after night, I would get little more pieces of this dream. This, the, the, it's like someone says, here's the framework of a puzzle. And every night you got a new puzzle piece. And as the puzzle began to take form, you realize it's a horrendous, deadly car crash. And as you look closer, it's your husband and the back seat's full of Christmas presents. So in this situation, it's not about a ghost, it's about seeing the future. That's a really interesting thing about psychic ability. It's not just seeing ghosts. Can you see a future? And if you see a future, can you change it? Are you supposed to change it? Why would they show this to you? And so night after night, I'm waking up in, in terror. And I look over to this, this man thinking, oh my gosh, I, I want to grow old with him. I don't, I don't want anything to happen. And, but he's okay. And every day he says, I'm going to go shopping. I said, you know, you don't need to. He says, I've only got this last weekend. And I said, no, no, no. You know, I have you. What else do I need? So Friday, this particular Friday, he comes home. And I can see in the dream that he's sick. I can see that it's pouring rain. It's dusk. And a woman runs a stop sign or stoplight and plows into the driver's side and kills him. I can see him standing next to his car, his 240Z, and being heartbroken that he didn't get to have a life with me or his career or anything else. I can see this future as clearly as I'm talking to you. And so I talked to him at three o'clock and he's fine. He's feeling great. So excited. We'll have a great weekend. And at six o'clock, I hear the whine of the, the, the car, the Z coming in, and he doesn't get out of the car. He just sits there. I'm thinking, what happened? Finally, he gets out of the car and he moves like he's 100 years old. And he comes into, the, into our little house and he says, I, he couldn't speak. He was so sick, violently sick. He said, what happened to you? And he said, the the corpsman decided to give all of the crew like six vaccines at once. And it made everybody deathly ill. The corpsman figured, oh, you have the weekend to get over it so that you're great for going to see. Well, he, he was in such agony, he could barely move. So I got him upstairs and, and got him into bed and, you know, gave him some aspirin or Tylenol to help him with the, the pain and how sick he was. And he said, I'm, I'm going to go shopping for you. And it's like, no, I don't think so. So the next morning it's pouring. It's going to pour all day. He comes down dressed and I, he says, I, I'm going to go shopping. And it's like, dude, I'm going to make cookies and you're going to go to bed and you're not going anywhere because if you go somewhere, this is what's going to happen. It's raining. You don't feel good. You're not buying me presents. You are the greatest gift. And, and so he didn't die that day. So I got to save his life because I could see what was coming. And he didn't understand the ability. He was just grateful to go back to bed. And then he, he went to see, and it's like that never happened. That, that this kind of thing happened to me several times. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can have multifacets of this ability to listen and to hear and to believe what you're hearing with a sense of responsibility and discernment where you don't run around saying the sky is falling. You, you have to calculate, is it tomorrow? When is it? Premonitions. 
they don't give you a due date. Is it this week? Is it next year? What is it? It's maddening. But in this case, it worked out really well. And we thank God for that. Yes, um, we do. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that, you know, when your gifts, I, I keep using the word gifts, even though I know that you say you shy away from that word, but, you know, for the sake of the conversation. So when you discovered your gifts or kind of realized that you were able to tap into these psychic abilities and you could see these things, you were more in tune with your intuition, you could see ghosts you were starting to pick up patterns to kind of understand the messages that you're receiving. As far as the ghosts go, right? Did you also study things? Did you read books? Did you take any sort of, have any sort of training in dealing with ghosts? Like, was there any additional learning yes. that you did outside of kind of picking up patterns from, you know, psychic knowings that you were receiving? When we lived in Italy, because we were stationed in Italy for three years in Naples, the base library of all things had this like six volume set about death. And I thought I really need to understand. It's one thing to understand living, but you really need to understand death to understand ghosts. And I read this thing cover to cover. Then I studied Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and she wrote Life After Death and Life After Life and then I started reading everything I could get my hands on about death and how it worked and what happened. And there's there's a lot of speculation. I read Rosemary Altea I, um, and she she was another really amazing psychic. And I, I studied everyone I could get my hands on who talked about death and life after death. I studied past life regressions, uh, people who talked about past lives because you don't die, you're gonna live again and again. So when you understand death, you have to also understand reincarnation. And what happened was, once you start opening those doors to those concepts, then you begin to see God's hand in everything. Whether it's people, I mean, I mined my own crystal. We used to own a crystal mine in Arkansas. What are crystals or what are they? Are they frozen light? Like a lot of people say, how do you use those? What do those have to do with ghosts? And then you come to the conclusion that it's about frequency. Then you have to marry frequency with the concepts of death. And then you learn that, um, why don't people cross over? That was absolutely baffling to me. Why don't people cross over? I mean, Everybody goes to church. They, I mean, there's, I don't know how many different religions on the planet. They all talk about God. Why is it nobody knows what to ha what happens to you when you die and what are you supposed to do next? And I just found that really baffling. And while I was encountering ghosts, I still did not know how to cross them over. And we moved to Charleston, South Carolina. I don't know if you've ever been to South Carolina. It's a beautiful state. Good Lord, is it haunted. You have Revolutionary War and the Civil War, and you have the slave trade, and you've got people who died in, in every conceivable way in South Carolina. And so we bought a house that was 18 months old on the Archdale Plantation, and the entire neighborhood was haunted. And we had a ghost named Jake, and he nearly drove us stark raving mad. And I, I wrote a um, series of ghost stories, ghost stories from the ghost point of view, volumes one, two, and three. That story in Charleston is the very first story. And I didn't know that a new house could be haunted because I didn't understand predecessor energy. And that's the energy of everybody who has ever lived on that land. And it was the site of the Archdale Plantation. We found the original ruins. My neighbor had a ghost. The lady down the street had a ghost who would come down and rearrange her furniture every single morning. She moved. She was terrified. Another guy, would. his home was over a stable. He heard horses all night. Another woman would come down on her rocking chairs, rocking in front of a blank wall, which obviously had a window at some time. And then I discovered my sister was living with us while she went to college. And um, 
I, I just couldn't believe this ghost. He would pound on the walls and run down the hall and he would steal things. I lost a diamond earring. My husband lost three sets of contact lenses. My son, who was a little, little kid, you know, 18 months old, two years old, lost his, you know, his tennis shoes vanished. You put them next to his bed for the morning and then the morning they're gone. What do you do with tennis shoes in a different dimension? Will somebody explain that? I had gold jewelry vanish. Uh, my neighbor did too. Jake was a thief. And one morning, Troy was at sea. I was going to take his, his, I was gonna, I'm, I'm about to drive my car and the car won't start. So I drove my husband to Z to work and I come back and I take my car to Somerville where the mechanic was. And he says, the car starts right up. And it's like, okay. I mean, I had to have it towed. And he said, yeah, the car started right up, but if you had driven this, you would have been in a horrible accident because this belt was was about to give way and you would have died. So I thought, okay, so did Jake save my life? Is that what happened? I just don't understand. And another time he made so much noise that we thought someone was breaking in, so we called the police. Well, the police came and they said, we can see someone was jimmying the lock of the back door. So it's a good thing you called us but we couldn't have heard it. We heard someone in our kitchen. That's why we called the police. So did Jake save us a second time? And I called the Duke University School of Parapsychology so I could understand what do you do with a ghost that's this mischievous? I mean, it was incredible. When we went to sell the house because we moved to Norfolk or to Virginia Beach, the real estate agent wouldn't even spend five minutes in the house. She was just terrified. Okay, and, and someone said, sprinkle a little salt. I am here to tell you, salt works really well in a lot of the dimensions, but it will not get rid of a ghost. You can sprinkle salt till the cows come home and you know you can sprinkle your doorway. That's just still not gonna work. Well, I still didn't know what to do. I just, and then we went to Norfolk and then we went to California and I was, I was the exo of a submarine training facility, and I had all these guys tell me all their psychic stories. And then I retired. And then my psychic ability exploded. And I started a computer company. <laughs> if that had been successful, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But I, the company didn't work, and I closed it, and, and I ended up talking to people about metaphysics, because that's all anybody wanted to talk about in ghosts. But I would, had developed a program to use an Apple computer and I was a value added reseller for Apple. I designed all this software, which was a lot of fun. And a guy at a, at a meeting at a convention handed me his business card. And from that moment on, my life went to hell in a handbasket because when you have psychic ability, it isn't to read brightly decorated cards or, you know, talk to ghosts. It's for service. It's for the service of humanity, whether you wear a funny hat or not. And it's for the service of the living and the dead, among other things. And if, if this guy had been able to do to me what he wanted, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. We wouldn't be able to share our valuable information with other people so that it would improve their lives because that's really what your podcast is about. It's changing perspective and improving life. That's really, that's really who you are. So I couldn't function after I got a hold of that business card. And basically, because of this man, I learned about black magic. I had no idea how powerful it was, that it was a real thing, and that there were things you could do that would combat it. And I have a book coming out probably in November called Psychic Children, Psychic People. And it tells you what to do in these situations. But at that point in time, I didn't know. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't drive a car. I felt like I was dying. And finally, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't stop coughing. And I ended up in an emergency room. And I felt like I was targeted for something, but I didn't understand it. And finally, I realized that it was the business card. And 
I didn't know what to do with the business card. Now I do know. And he used it as a connection to be able to have access to me and sent a lot of very dark energy because that energy was so dark. Literally, it makes you sick. Well, along the way, after that happened, I learned how to start sending that energy back because I wrapped his business card in silk. But you can't just wrap it in silk and just, you know, like a, you know, you have to wrap it in shifting sides of the weave to create a barrier. Silk is psychically powerful and a very high frequency. And it caused him to stop uh, having access to me. In the meantime, I ended up in an emergency room with about two hours left to live. After I recovered from all that, um, a lot of what had been sent to me because of what I learned to do was basically sent back to this man who was a very, um, he was a practicing black magician. And one day I was sitting talking to my husband and my brother and I could see that this man was dying. All of a sudden it's like someone opened a door, a window, and I could see that he was dying. What he tried to send to me, he died with. And I saw him leave his body and I saw him begin to you know, look around like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. And I saw him in the ambulance and I, I realized that he died. And my brother said, well, we should cross him over. And I said, great idea. How do I do that? I do not know how to do that. And he said, well, we'll just ask God for help. Can you imagine anything so simple? And we did. And I closed my eyes and I brought in some angels. And it's like, I saw this incredible light just a little sliver of it. And I invited the angels to escort this man to the heaven world. Yes, he tried to do something terrible to me and God knows how many other people, but he was not mine to judge. Very important point. My job was to help. It wasn't to judge. And he turned to me and he, and he asked me that question. He said, why would you help me? I tried really hard to kill you. And I said, well, because you weren't mine to judge and maybe if you cross over in your next life you won't you won't do these terrible things what a concept you know and so the scene closed and after that I could remote view and I didn't know that really was a thing till I realized that the CIA was training people at the Monroe Institute in Virginia and I um I had to perfect the skill because remote viewing uses massive amounts of psychic energy and you're exhausted when you do it, but it's a muscle. You have to develop it. Once you develop remote viewing, then you are able to see ghosts, predecessor energy, stacks of time far more readily. Now it opens the door for your spiritual service to be a thousand percent greater than it was. Now you have a much more significant karmic responsibility for using your skill set to the greatest level that you can. Let me stop for a minute. I know I'm chattering on and on here. <laughs> no, this is so good. Okay. First, I want to ask, because I'm sure the listeners are listening. They're probably curious like I am. Why did the guy want to essentially harm you, right? What was the intention behind sending black magic to you? Was it a competition, competitive thing in terms of business? No. I mean, I think that's a that's an extremely important question. And the answer is that sometimes other forces can see what your future is, even if you can't see it. If I had died in the way they were trying to, to basically kill me, then I wouldn't have written the crossing over prayer. I wouldn't have written nine books. I wouldn't be having these conversations with you and other hosts. I wouldn't be helping people understand suicide in a whole different way. Or what do you do with a murderer? Or how do you help someone who was murdered? Or what do you do after suicide? I wouldn't be able to do this level of spiritual service. And along the way, there are people like you who are sharing this information and you're earning the karma of sharing the information of how to be of spiritual service, which 
carries with it a much more elevated level of karma, which is a very good thing. And if I was stopped, then all of what was to come would not happen. It took me a while to figure it out. It's like, why would you pick me? I'm just so not important. You know, I'm just living my life, helping here and there. But it's a lot more than that. When you, when, when my ability got to the level where it is now, and you can cross over thousands of people at a time, you can cross over entire um, battlefields or graveyards or everybody in a hospital who's died. You could develop that level of ability. You're depriving the dark side of the energy of the dead. Think about that. Because they're feeding on the energy of that person's suffering. And Christ came to earth to relieve suffering. And if we want to be like Christ, who was the example for us all, or the generosity and the kindness of the Buddha or any of the other great ones, we help. And when you cross over a soul, one, they're not earning karma in the lower astral realms anymore. What does the 23rd Psalm say? He restoreth my soul. Where do serial killers come from? Thieves and murderers and rapists and, and child traffickers. They come from the lower astral, from these dark realms. And the more evil they do, the more bits and pieces of their souls are shaved off, life after life after life. So when someone comes along and crosses them over into the heaven world, in my father's house are many mansions based on the frequency of the person who died is where you go. Then the higher realms can help that soul to be restored. They carry the karma of their actions of all previous lives, but maybe the next life will not be the actions of vile crime. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Perfectly, because as you were talking, I was going to say it sounds like this battle between good and evil. And I know it's a lot more nuanced than that, but I'm, you know, I have to use those words to make sure everybody's following along. And you basically just explained that, right? It sounds like you were targeted because of the light work that you would be doing. Because I have heard people talk about these lower astral entities that feed off of negativity here on earth, right? Yes. Feed off Very- of negative frequency. So they they plant things that evoke certain reactions out of people, right? Like whether it's fear, jealousy, hatred, anger. I mean, you just think about like the worst emotions that people can have. So in, in the realm of the work that you're doing, especially as it pertains to ghosts who are stuck on this earth um, realm because maybe they don't want to, they're shocked that they died or they're still holding on to very tough emotions. They're still feeding off of that. There's a, there's a reason why those lower astral entities would, would want ghosts on earth without them crossing over. If, and, and I don't mean to oversimplify everything that you're saying, but that's what I'm picking up from what you're communicating. Well, you absolutely have it. You have it correct. You have it absolutely correctly. Okay. You got it. So there's something that you said that I want to go back to, which I think sparked my curiosity for wanting to have this conversation in the first place. Like I told you at the beginning, even before we started recording, is that I've I've heard people talk about ghosts all the time. And I'm very interested in this whole idea of our multidimensional existence. That's why I created this podcast, right? To kind of have these conversations. But what always confused me about ghosts, right? Was like this idea that they would be stuck, like an uh, a spirit would cross over, someone would die and be stuck on earth. I never understood that concept because my understanding was that once you leave the human body, all of the stuff that weighed you down, all of the emotions that weighed you down, you would leave them behind. So the idea of ghosts being stuck here and having to be crossed over, I I just, there was like a little bit of a cognitive dissonance there. But so I say all of that to say, what are ghosts? Let's start there. And why are they not able to shift and move to other dimensions once leaving the body? Why are they still holding on to human emotions? 
there are many people who do cross over. I want to be very clear about that. There are people who have no fear of death. Do you remember the movie Ghost, the Patrick Swayze movie, the Demi Moore, the Whoopi Goldberg, and, you know, steals every scene she's in. She's so good at that. She, when Patrick Swayze dies, he doesn't understand he's dead. He's running after his murderer. And only when he turns around and sees his body, does he realize that he died. Now, some people turn around and see their body and they can't see it. They don't know they're dead. So we have multifacets here. One, what if you don't know you're dead? That happens on battlefields. The guy gets, you know, bullet wounds and just keeps fighting. He doesn't realize that he's died. And I've cleared many a battlefield of people who went, you mean the battle's over? Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. You didn't make it. And I go, God, I'm so tired. Yeah, I get it. Or you have the people who realize that death has come. They see the light and they are so thrilled to move into the light. And they see their family members and there's this wonderful welcome or their pets that they love that died. It's beautiful. You have people who are so angry that they want to control their living relatives. You have people who died and they were loved and and they loved their family and their family is, it's like the family's wrapping all these black cords around their ghostly relative and they're holding them on the earth plane. I mean, that's actually what one of the ghosts said to me. That story is called the exit strategy. And, and I remember it was a doctor and he said, if you don't cross me over, my family will never let me go. And if you're a child, my niece died at six. She was just going to hang around her sister. It was one of the hardest remote views I ever did. I, I, I kept saying, Ariana, you have to go back in your body. She says, nope, Aunt Tina, I'm done. I mean, I went into quite a bit of shock. She had no idea what she was supposed to do. So I had to cross her over, which was, it was good that I got to do that, but it was, it was such a bizarre thing for me. You have people who, they go to church three or four times a week, twice on Sunday, and they tell me when they die that they were born in sin, they died in sin, God can't love them or they're guilty. If you left your child in the back seat of a hot car and the, the child died, would you feel worthy of crossing over? Maybe not. Guilt will seek punishment. That's why if you're going to cross over the dead or you're going to use something that I call the crossing over prayer, actually, this is on all my websites, both my websites, you want to cross that person over without judgment or prejudice. You don't know what their issue is. You don't want to know. Believe me, I hear stuff that would make the angels weep. It's so hard to hear. Cross them over because they're gonna receive healing to the, to the nth degree of their soul. They will get all kinds of education. They sit down with counselors of divine wisdom who help them understand the life just lived. So let's go through the scenario of what happens when you die, whether it's instant, you're in a car accident, you know, you're in a hospital and you flatline, whatever your method of death, the process is always the same. And this information is in the Tibetan book of living and dying, because I want your listeners to know that there are there are resources. And in this book that's coming out, I will have a lot of these reading, you know, all the suggested reading so that they can educate themselves as well. They don't have to just believe me. The process is that all the body systems start to shut down. It's like you're shutting down a building and you run out, you go around, you turn off all the lights. And the last to be shut down is your, basically the heart, all, you know, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, all the stuff shuts down. Inside of the heart chakra, inside the physical body of the heart, there is also a brain. There's a brain up here and there's a brain in your heart, which they're now learning. This has recently come out. Inside that heart cross part is the seed atom of the soul. Inside the seed atom of the soul are the Akashic records. 
those records are built every moment you live through something called Aka chords, AKA. This information comes from the Hawaiian Huna tradition. I studied a lot of different traditions. H-U-N-A. So you have from your solar plexus, you have this thin blue line of what's called Kino Aka substance that connects you to every person you've ever met, every place you've ever been, everything you ever touched, every experience that you ever had. And it creates the memory, the record, the Akashic, AKA Akashic record that lives inside your heart. When you die and the heart stops beating and you flatline, then the energy that animated you under the laws of physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed. That energy has to go somewhere. So when people say, oh, there's no such things as ghosts, it's like, dude, it's physics, give it up. When that happens, then that energy that animated you because you can't stay in this body any longer, it leaves the body and the body actually loses weight because the energy of the soul has weight. And there's Karelian photography, which was, um, this guy Karelian was a Russian photographer and he can photograph, he photographed people at death. And you see the soul leave the body and leaves the third dimension and transitions to the fourth dimension, which is a land of no time or space or gravity. It's what's called the lower astral realm. But why do we have it? Because it's like a step up transformer to go from the third dimension of physicality directly into the heaven world, you have a frequency differential. Am I making sense? So when you move into the fourth dimension, ask for angels to be with you. They'll automatically lift your frequency up. And you may see your body, you may not. You may see your relatives, you may not. But you're gonna be in a land that is, you're not familiar with. You may see beings, you may see creatures, you may see things coming to you. Remember the 23rd Psalm, I fear no evil. Why would you have that in the Psalm? And then the 23rd Psalm exists in every faith on earth. Did you know that? I thought that was astounding because it's God's message to us of what to do at death. We just never looked at it that way. And then you see the light. A lot of people see that light, but they don't, they're waiting for someone to tell them what to do. Most faiths don't tell you what to do. So when you see that light, move right toward it. You can ask for an angel escort. If someone you love is dying, surround them with angels and ask those angels to take them right into the heaven world and you can do that for them. Once you cross into the heaven world, your frequency is shifted and you're entering a space in the heaven world based on your frequency at death. Now, if you were a murderer, you're going to go to a frequency commensurate, a location frequency commensurate with your frequency at death and your actions because you carry that karma. But once someone crosses into the heaven world, the karmic clock stops, which means as long as somebody is a ghost, they're incurring karma. They're interfering with the living. They're not participating in soul evolution. You cross them over, all of a sudden, now they're in the heaven world. People are welcoming them. They are filled with love and light. They get answers. Why did I have such an arduous life? What was the point of my baby dying? Why did my husband leave me? Why did my mother, why was she so cruel? Or why did my dad abandon us? We want answers. And you sit down at this gorgeous table with counselors of divine wisdom and they go over the life just lived, not because you're being judged, but to help you understand, to know, to understand, to participate in soul evolution, to evolve to higher and higher, more aware levels as a soul. Because we don't, we don't reincarnate forever. There comes a point at which we have evolved past that. Right. There, there's a whole new world of amazing things to to participate in in the higher realms, which is a really cool thing to look forward to. 
Absolutely. So there, there are two things that you said that I, I really want to touch on. The first one is that if someone was a murderer or they did very horrible things in during their lifetime, when they leave their body, they go to a different dimension that's a frequency match of their energy at the time that they died or at the time that they transitioned. Does that mean that they're going to hell? Well, if you have a very bad person who dies, they're going to be met with these horrible, you remember in um, the movie Ghost, those those three foot high little creatures with the red eyes? Those are called lower realm intelligences. I've seen them for years. And <clears throat> when you know what you're doing, you can dispatch them pretty quickly, but they meet the evil ones. And then they take them to, because you have the fourth dimension but it's so difficult to describe because you can take them to layers in like strata of rock. Well, they're low, the low, the more vile you are, the lower layers. I mean, if you committed genocide, then you're, you're, the amount of murder that you've committed is so heinous that you're going to go to these deeper and deeper layers. And then they're going to recycle you and have you come back and do worse things. That's why you cross that person over as quickly as you can. If you happen to be in that position and, and, and that person's, if they, if you cross them into the heaven world, they're going to go to a location in that fifth dimension commensurate with the karma they've created. If they don't cross over, they go into the depth of the lower astral or the fourth dimension commensurate with their level of evil and then they will train them to do worse evil the next lifetime okay so what i'm hearing is that if they go to the lower part of the fourth dimension right I, i've heard someone say that you know people as we're always evolving there's this demarcation between self service to others which is i guess the more positive side and then service to self which tends to go towards the more more lower astral realms right so i guess some people would be going to 4d negative and then some people would be going to 4d positive if i if i was trying to trying to simplify everything that you're saying and most times when people end up in that lower astral i guess the lower astral intelligence when you say recycle them, they they quickly reincarnate to kind of carry out the same things that they were doing. Is that what you yes. were, what you're saying? Yes, they will end up. They have the potential to do worse things. Now, because you still have free will, they can do. They can change. The problem is, you know how right now we're seeing a ton of narcissistic personality disorder or immature personality disorder or borderline. There's all different kinds of personality disorders. And if you start shaving off pieces of their conscience, that means that person doesn't care about somebody else. That's how it starts. Sociopaths, soci uh, psychopaths are born. The Jeffrey Dahmers of the world, the Richard Specks of the world are born. Their families don't understand how they could have perfectly normal children and this child is a murderer. I can't even imagine their horror at discovering this. I mean, the Unabomber's family turned him in. They figured out that it was him because they didn't want to be responsible for any more deaths. It had to have been a really tough thing. And when a, um, a murderer is crossed over, you take them out of that fourth dimension and you're putting them in a place where the dark side can't reuse them. Does that make sense? That's really what I'm talking about. Because people say, well, you know, he deserves to go to hell, dude. The hell he's going to, he's going to be welcomed. That is not what you want. You have to break the cycle. <laughs> I'm sad. That's funny. He's going to be welcomed. Um, okay. So I think what I'm I'm still trying to understand, right, is this idea that when someone crosses, when someone leaves their body, right? Because again, we have to make sure we are distinguishing between someone leaving their body and crossing over. Most people who pass 
end up crossing over. Right. But my thing is, I just always had this sense. Uh, I've, I've always had this belief based on what everyone said, obviously still on a journey, taking in as much information as I can, that it's supposed to be obvious that we're, we're supposed to transcend all of the humanness, but it seems like even for those who are able to cross over and go into the higher astral realms, it still seems like there's a lot of healing and understanding that needs to occur after leaving the body. It's not automatic knowledge of, oh, I'm I'm more than what I experienced on earth. Like it's it's not automatic knowledge of high frequency principles, which is I, I guess that's what I'm struggling to understand people are clueless not because there's Mm. anything wrong with them is that no one has taught them can't run around pointing fingers and blaming i didn't understand this took me years to understand this when someone dies if they know they're going to die or my brother died he he looked at me and he said what's going to happen when i die i actually have a video on that what's going to happen when i die and i explained the body's going to shut down and i surrounded him with angels in a protected place in the other dimension. And as soon as he flatlined, I made sure he was crossed over. I mean, there's had to be some advantage to having a quirky sister. So when someone dies, for the most part, they're completely confused. They thought that they'd become compost and that would be it. They're completely astonished when they just go on being who they've always been. But now no one can hear them except the odd psychic. No one's responding to them. There's no one to tell them where to go. They see this light, but they don't know what to do with it. Um, I had a, a ghost in Tennessee on this woman's property, and he was crossing the street in Norfolk, Virginia, and he was on his cell phone, and a woman hit him, and she was on her cell phone, and she killed him, and he goes sailing. He felt her hit him, and he went sailing into darkness realized he was dead followed my client and she went from norfolk to tennessee and that's how he ended up there he kind of liked her and so he said you know i i didn't know what to do are you here to help me like yep that's my job i'm here to help you so i bring in an angel and i have the angel cross him over Because the contact with the angel automatically raises that soul's frequency. If you're not sure what to do, send them an angel and ask the angel to cross them over. I mean, it can be that achingly simple. I mean, if you want to say the crossing over prayer, that's great. So let me tell you a story about how powerful this can be. I had a client in upper state New York. um, And... She called me and she said, can you cross my father over? He was just executed as a multiple murderer. He was a horrible man. He was executed in some prison up there. But he's haunting me day and night. And he's telling me to murder my four-year-old daughter. It's horrible. I just want you to cross him over for me. And I said, you know, I could do that. It wouldn't be really difficult, but it would be so much better if you did it. She said, well, I don't know. And I said, Your father has had power over you all your life. And wouldn't it be nice that you, if you took your power back from this really terrible man, because he may have been terrible, but that doesn't mean you are. You're a good person. You love your daughter. You just want, you want it resolved in a karmically correct way. So I respect you for that. And I said, there's the crossing over prayer for murderers and the crossing over prayer book. And I want you to try it or just use the plain crossing over prayer. Try it. Say it multiple times and you're going to feel this shift, gentle, subtle shift. And if it doesn't work, you know, you can always call me. I'll help you. So a week or so went by and she calls me back and she says, you know what? I said the crossing over prayer and I said it over and over and over and over again. And I, I couldn't believe it. I felt this something change and then my little girl says mommy mommy the bad man is gone now she didn't know her daughter could hear him 
Can you imagine how terrifying that is for a child? What a nightmare for the mother. She took her power back from that man. So she had a karmic opportunity. God bless her. She rose to the occasion. She removed him. It was a really big deal. I, I find it so fascinating that someone would pass and still want to stay tethered to the earth to torture a loved one or to still harass people that they're it I don't know it's just it's that I have so many thoughts here right I'm, I'm trying to synthesize them first thing I want to ask because I'm, I might forget this does the crossover prayer also work for people who are possessed right because we started off the conversation talking about your first encounter being someone entering your body trying to overtake yes, your body it would have worked for her it would have worked for her yes absolutely okay so the other thing too like like we've been talking about throughout this whole conversation is that sometimes people are shocked that they've passed or they don't know what to do right and I've heard a lot of people say that we plan our whole life so before incarnating, we pick our parents, we pick the people that we want to have certain relationships with, and we also pick when and how we die. So if we do all of that, then how come if when, when we die, there are people who genuinely are shocked or confused and not they don't know what to do? Because again, it's like my understanding is that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So the idea that like us as humans would help dead people or spirits cross over seems kind of like contradictory to that statement in the sense of this higher consciousness and higher knowing that you automatically remember when you, you go back into the spirit world. Does that make sense? I know that was a lot there that I said. It does make sense. And the problem is that you don't remember that. When you're born, something called the veil comes down so that you don't remember who you were supposed to marry and you don't remember that you picked those parents. You don't remember it. And then you don't remember it for a reason because you know how people say, well, you only live once. You don't, you live a whole lot of times. And you always hope that this time you'll be able to get things right. But most people have no conscious awareness that they've lived before, that they knew those people before, that they had a past life. And I met my mother-in-law and I knew I had known her before because I was, I had this, basically this desire to vomit <laughs> um, because, and I, it took me a while to figure out that she had been, she had engineered my murder in another life. So, but I didn't know that when I met her, I just knew that the thought of being around her was nauseating and my subconscious recognized her but my conscious did not know who she was. It took me a while to put the pieces together. And so we are, we are given, graciously given another opportunity to get it right, to learn. And my mother-in-law couldn't stand me either. But the two of us worked it out. We worked through it. So by the time she died, we could say that we loved each other. That is soul evolution. She changed and I changed. You don't come here because, you know, somebody upstairs is bored. You don't come up here because we have to learn. All of that said, when you die, you still don't remember all the stuff that you were knowing before you came in. And if you reincarnate from the fourth dimension, you're probably going to remember a whole lot less. So when you die, either you don't know you're dead or if you do know you're dead, you reject it. If you know you're dead and you don't want to reject it, you, you are grieving. You don't want to leave your family. If you took your own life, you hang around your family trying to tell them how sorry you are. You're horrified at their grief. So you don't think God could ever love you. So you're not going to go into the light and you're not even sure what you're supposed to do. So there's many, many facets to this. I would say a handful of people cross over. And a lot of people who, who are really good people, just they don't know what's supposed to happen next. 
There's a wonderful movie with Matt Damon about the uh, tsunami in um, Thailand um, in 2000, from December 26, 2004, was that massive earthquake, one of the largest earthquakes on Earth. The uh, Earth jetted up a thousand feet, which caused that tidal wave. And it's a story, of, it's apparently based on a true story that she was swept up in the tidal wave. And for a moment, she died. And she saw all of these other people. And then they vanished. It's like all these shadowy figures. And you don't know who you are. You don't know what you're supposed to do. But she was resuscitated. And after that, she wasn't the same. She had an awareness she'd never had before. She meets Matt Damon. He was a psychic. And they began to speak the same language. And that's, that's a fascinating film about how kind of how hard it is to be psychic or how to get people to understand when you have an experience that you can't explain if you die and come back that's what all the near-death experiences are that's trying to let people know that there's this wonderful light if you go to the light they're welcoming you it's awesome when i crossed my niece over when she died she was six her grandfather met her he got down on bended knee i actually got to see that he had died um, about four years previous, and he just swept her up in the most big, beautiful hug. But if I hadn't crossed her over, she would have been haunting her sister the rest of her life. So, okay, speaking of the light, right, because I do want to ask about that and, and reincarnation as well, right? So I've heard recently that you know, this whole concept of going into the light could also potentially be a trap where people's souls are kind of similar to what you described with people who go to the lower astral realm where they're quickly recycled. So this idea that even though people are going to the light and they're seeing their loved ones, the notion that they have to continue to reincarnate is actually false. And that light puts them on a trajectory of reincarnating pretty quickly without them realizing that they have the free will to not reincarnate. Have you heard that? Well, there's all kinds of theories there. Um, you don't get a choice. You're going to reincarnate until your soul has evolved to a certain point. And as far as people deceiving you when it comes to the light, that implies that you know, that implies something that, and honestly, I've been at this a really long time, and I've just never seen that. When the light comes, it's so, there's no mistaking it. I don't know how else to describe it. In this last scene with Patrick Swayze, he says, you just can't imagine the love. You can't make that up. The lower astral cannot manifest that dynamic feeling of love of this embrace that's why i i send angels that's why in the crossing over prayer you attach an angel to someone and they escort them into the light but you don't have to have an angel i do it because it i bring a child angel in for a child you know it depends on the person and some people don't need that and some people really do and I just have not seen anybody kind of deceive you with that. I was, I mean, it doesn't mean I'm all knowing. That's certainly not true. But you have to remember to create that realm of that much light will cost the lower astral massive amounts of energy. You can't remember, this is only about energy. The lower astral feeds on the energy of others. They feed on filth and hate and war, feeding and it's a feeding frenzy. When you are filled with blessing and prayer, it's like a force field that shuts it. The force is the force of God that is with you. And when you see that light and you feel that warmth, you can't make that up. And it, they would have to expend 
such staggering amounts of energy. Remember, they're not going to spend energy. They don't have to. So I got to be honest, I think that's false because it's a clever trick that turns people away from the light. But I would offer that when you feel the love that's in that light, the dark side can't create that. They just can't. Yeah. God's love is not something that evil can create. Right. So to go back to reincarnation really quickly about having to reincarnate, I've been thinking about that more deeply because, you know, we talk heavily about freedom of choice, free will, right? We have free will to choose. So why is it that we couldn't choose or decide not to continue to reincarnate? Because, you know, I've, I've, I hear a lot of people say what you said, right? That we have to, you know, to clear up karmic debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are other people who say, no, we, we don't have to come back and reincarnate. Some people might choose to be spirit guides. They might choose to do other work in other higher dimensions in the spirit dimension, but we don't have to come back. So I want to hear your thoughts more in depth about why, why we have to come back and how, and, and how can you reconcile that with free will? I think it's a very good question to, to be a spirit guide. You have to be so advanced that there are you have to reincarnate to the point that your soul evolves to a level where they will not let you reincarnate otherwise you have to come back it's like there's a certain point at which free will is trumped for instance if you're in the lower astral and i appear on the scene my free your free will doesn't trump my moving you across. I have had a thousand ghosts say, well, I'm just not going. And it's like, I'm sorry, my, my presence trumps that. You will cross over. You will stop harassing this person. You will stop standing on the street corner causing accident after accident after accident. It's over. It's done right now. And at first I didn't understand how I ended up with that ability, but they were crossed over. And the families who were released from this burden of, of this feeling was tremendous. So once you leave, when you're in the third dimension, you do have free will. When you're in the fourth dimension, you have a certain amount of free will and that free will creates karma. But when someone comes to take you to a higher level, you can't, you can't overrule them. I've crossed over black magicians from the lower astral who had come to harass a ghost. I just crossed them all over. I've crossed over and removed lower astral beings, creatures, lower realm intelligences, hideous black magicians, broken up blister dimensions. Because it's kind of, it's kind of my job. But a, an ordinary mortal person who dies in a traffic accident and realizes they're dead, they're going to be crossed over if someone helps them, if they, unless they are savvy enough to say, oh, I see the light, I'm gonna cross over. And a lot of people when told it's your very last life, they're going to grieve that because once you get to the place that you can perform true spiritual service on a slightly elevated level, the opportunity to help humanity changes you on levels you can't imagine. The thought that you wouldn't be able to come back and perform levels of service, it's going to make you grieve. Or to be with people that you have loved so dearly would make you really sad. When someone says, I hope this is my last life, I'm done, kind of tells me that's not it. Because let's look at a different way. Why did Christ come to earth? Christ came to earth, not to die on a cross for your sins that you hadn't committed yet, you know, where they came up with that. Sorry, little, little thing there. Christ died on the, the cross. Do we think he could have stopped that if he wanted to? Yes. He's manipulating karma of some things that most of us will never understand. His entire point in being here was not to be born in a manger and die on a cross, was all the things that he said. It was the energy of understanding mortal people 
of offering them a view of the light, a view of God, a view of hope and of love that most people, especially in those times, could not have imagined. And there were precursors that they were the Athenes, Essenes, and their their job was to make make ready for Christ. They knew He was coming. Their job was to get ready for Him. And when you when you begin to, there's a wonderful book called the Urantia book, U R A N T I A. It's two thousand ninety five pages of tissue paper, pages. And the back third of it, the last third of it, accounts for every moment of Christ's life. Anyone who is truly interested in Christ or truly loves Christ, I strongly recommend you read that. It's written by off-worlders. When you read it, you won't quite be able to wrap your brain around it. But when you start reading about Christ, it's as if there's a part of you that breathes in the beauty and the love of his words. Because he didn't come here to die on the cross for our sins. He came here to give us a message of hope and love, not to make us guilty for eternity. And that's how it's been turned in. That's actually, to me, black magic when someone says, you're a sinner. I'm tired of that. I just see good people all around me. Are there bad people? Yes. Well, let's help them. Let's help them. Let's not turn away. Let's help them. So what I'm hearing you say is that people have to come back to reincarnate because it's just part of the evolution. You can't bypass that. You can't evolve <laughs> bypass that. on the other yeah. side. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I, I keep thinking about it because to me, it, it makes sense, right? It definitely makes sense. But I guess what I struggle with is the have to Um part of it because I think at any point as a spirit because it's free will we can choose to for example stop evolving right like it's if you sign up to go to college for example right like we sign up to come to this earth we sign up to incarnate here maybe other planets who knows we can decide you know what I don't want to finish the program I don't want to graduate with a degree a certificate right so that's kind of how I don't want to oversimplify I know the laws of the universe are a lot grander than that but that's that's kind of what I think about too um in terms of like well I why wouldn't a spirit be able to say, you know what, I don't want to continue to to evolve. I just kind of want to stay where I am. So that that's that's something that I'm continuing to think about. I haven't arrived at what resonates with me the most, but that that's what I've been considering. So let me tell you a story that mm -hmm. might help illustrate this. I had a client who came to me because she was a she wanted to divorce her husband and she was struggling with it. So we did that. But in the process, we, we did some past life regressions. We did quite a few. And in every single life, she committed suicide. Every single life. Sometimes within hours of this particular person dying, it was always the same person. And one time it was a father or a brother or a husband or a child or whatever. And she couldn't stand it. But she came back again and again and again and again. Because karmically, she had to face the death of that soul and learn to live beyond it. She took the easy way out. So <clears throat> she had met that soul in this life. Well, we worked for a while and she didn't need me anymore. And she was on an airplane and met a Marine pilot. And he was a super cool guy. And I mean, it was instantaneous love at first sight she knew him he was that soul and they had this wonderful romance and they were engaged and he died in a plane crash his jet crashed and i as soon as i saw it on the news i knew that that was the guy and because she had told me about how excited she was they were going to get married and she's going to have a life with him and he died and i said how are you doing? And she said, it's really hard, but I think I'm going to be okay. And we talked a few more times. And then a year later, I got a wedding invitation. 
she was marrying another Marine. And I called her and I said, you know, I, I don't know any of your friends at your wedding. It's so kind of you to think of me. And she said, you have to come because you're the only person on earth who will know that I have participated in soul evolution and I didn't leave this time. You will understand the significance of this wedding and every day that I live hereafter because I have to learn the lesson. And so I miss him every day, she told me. I had lunch with her several weeks later. I love my clients, <laughs> long after they're not my clients. And I miss him every day, but the man I'm married to is a good man. And I'm learning, I'm learning. And I, it is God's grace and generosity that gives us an opportunity to grow and to change. You can't be a spirit guide if you haven't cleaned up your own house. If you aren't filled to the highest degree of wisdom, because you didn't fulfill all of your karmic obligations. The higher realms won't look the other way with that. You're going, karma is not going to be erased. It has to be balanced. balanced. That's exactly right. Hmm. Okay. Well, for the people who are listening and they're thinking about their loved ones, right? How can we tell the difference between a loved one visiting us, right? Because some people will see signs. We might see a butterfly. We might see a quarter because our grandmother always used to give us a quarter, something like that. How can we tell the difference between a loved one coming to see us versus a ghost, right? Because some people might see orbs or something. Like how, how can we distinguish between spirit visiting us, loved ones who've crossed over versus ghosts that could be haunting us and are struggling to cross over? If you're getting any signs at all, the person didn't cross over and that's a ghost. So say the crossing over prayer and cross them over. Really? Yes. I'm so, I'm so, wow. I, I mean, I don't know what answer I was expecting, but I was, really? Because if, for instance, when my brother died, I knew he crossed over because I was physically, I watched him leave. And he has come to me twice in dreams. So when you cross over, you are allowed to come to your funeral and you're allowed to visit your family members in a dream on rare occasions. The whole point of it is not to interfere with the life that the mortal person is living because you are in karma in that way. So if you're hanging around and giving them signs, it's a distraction and it earns that ghost, that soul karma, not necessarily a good thing. And I know people say, oh, I know that she's thinking about me. Cross them over. Believe me, it's going to be the compassion you will want for yourself. And once they've crossed over and you stop seeing those things, now you have proof. You can prove it to yourself. The butterflies in the quarter and the penny here and there. I hear that all the time. You're not helping the dead and the dead aren't helping you. It may sound good and it may sound like I'm being a little harsh. If you deal with the volume of dead that I deal with, these people need help. And it's easier on the earth and everybody's environmentally conscious, but the dead are a burden to the earth because the dead always have the city nature about them. Even if it was the grandmother you loved, <clears throat> cross them over. Give them the greatest gift you could possibly give them, which is the light. You would want that for yourself. I know parents who hold on to their child who died. I just like the person near me. And it's like, I'm sorry. You aren't helping your child. And it, and it, and it, it exacerbates your grief. When you cross the soul over, now it's just your grief you're dealing with. Because a lot of times they're grieving too. And you can't separate your grief from their grief. And this is absolutely true with suicide. A lot of people say suicide is contagious. That's because you become in resonance with someone who just took their life because they're standing around going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. I'm so sorry. 
you cross them over. It's called the compassion prayer for suicide. You cross them over. All this copycat suicide stops because now you're dealing with just your grief. That's enough. That's a massive amount. And so the romance of, of a sign from a, a dead loved one sounds wonderful, but it's not good for either of you. It Part just... of the issue of growth is working through your grief and releasing attachment, accepting that that person's death happened in the right way, in the right time. And when you move forward with your life and you keep them deep in your heart because you will always love them, you will see them again, then you are participating in soul evolution and you've helped them to participate in soul evolution. And that's really important. Wow. My mind is just like blown at what you just said, that even though we're getting signs, of course, like a lot of our loved ones, we assume are good people, right? So it's not like not hunting us in the way that we think about in movies where like they're these evil nefarious energy per se. They could be comforting energy, to be honest, sometimes, but it's the attachment like it. there needs to be a release. That is that is so fascinating. You wow. would be surprised. I had a, a client in, um, I can't remember, she's North or South Dakota. Her 17-year-old son took his life. And she said, well, you cross him over. And I said, yes, but this is your son. It's an intimate thing. You use the compassion prayer for suicide. If you feel like it didn't work, let me know and I'll take care of it. And she called me back and she said, I crossed him over the whole room lit up with light. I could feel it. I, she was stuttering. It was such an astonishing experience. And then and a couple months later, she asked me to write a prayer for her to say, to send to him. She said, I'm now helping other parents cross over their, their teenagers who killed themselves. And the difference in how you grieve is dramatic. And if you have this wonderful prayer that you can say, and send them your loving energy into the heaven world. You've broken the attachment, but you've furthered the love. And that's a very important differentiation. People die by so many means, whether it's cancer or suicide, an accident or murder. Did a whole I did a whole podcast all just about murder and what happens. And um, and what you're what you're doing is. You have told the soul, I love you. I'm going to miss you with all my heart. And I love you so much. I'm going to set you free to feel the warmth and the light of God. And I'm going to be okay. I am going to live after. And every time I think of you, I'll think of you in that blazing light. Is there anything better than that? Wow. 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 So much. Wow, there's so much there. Um, grief. So you mentioned that souls, when they leave the body as well, also grieve. That's something I didn't even think about. I mean, it makes sense when you talk about it, right? Especially if people die young, die unexpectedly, even if when they die older, I, I can imagine just grieving the loved ones that are still li living and grieving exactly. the loss that they feel for them as well. So and that could also tether them, their energy to their loved ones here on earth. Okay. I but understand that. That's a, that is a really, really crucial point because they'll say, but I, I want to raise my daughter. I don't want to leave my husband. I, I died too early. I, this can't be. So their grief is massive. You can't tell whether what you're feeling is yours or theirs. That's huge. That will affect your health. Now, if you have a, someone who died of a terrible disease or they, they died of cancer or whatever, and that person is lingering with you, you're now in resonance with that frequency and you can take on that same illness and it can kill you too. You need to cross them over. It's the most loving act. Wow. Okay. Last question related to this, just again, to clarify, because some people say they receive messages and I'm not talking about physical messages, but they might get like an intuitive hit that they feel like came from a loved one that crossed over. Is that a ghost per se, or is that just like 
spirit communicating with you from a different dimension? It can be, depends on who you are. I mean, it really can depend on who you are and whether you're not, you're in tune with your psychic sense. It was not a dead loved one that told me to stop that car in South America. It wasn't. I mean, I've had those messages for years and I believed it was a beings from the higher realms that are gently helping to guide me so that I can do this job. Sometimes people come with a spiritual mission. Sometimes they have a purpose on earth and sometimes that purpose is just to survive childhood. If you have, I mean, some people have horrendous childhoods and it's just look at human trafficking right now. But some people have a mission and the longer they live, they become very conscious of that mission and to, to do it, it's not like you get a guidebook. You're going to be listening through prayer. Some people use meditation. Um, one of I, I I did have a teacher briefly. He said when you're when you're really in tune, you're in what's called a constant meditation. You're always listening. You're always getting that sense, and you have to kind of turn off the rest of the world to really focus. That's what crystals do for me. I have thousands of them um, everywhere, actually, even in my kitchen to, to using blessing and prayer and beautiful music rocket the frequency of a location, the higher your frequency, the easier it is to hear the higher realms. So I'm, I'm answering that. So could it be a loved one from who died, who's helping you? And you cross them over, maybe, but it could also be some being from the higher realms who you're becoming, you're doing so much service. You are filling yourself with love and compassion. You're now opening up this pathway for higher beings to be able to work with you for a greater good. That is a possibility. Mm, okay. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. And you know, and talking about crossing over, do spirits, can some spirits eventually just cross over by themselves without any sort of intervention from people here yes. on earth? Some of them can see the light and go forward. Some of them just see a psychic that looks really bright, whether it's a child. That's why I wrote this, this book that I'm desperately trying to release. Oh, editing is a nightmare. <laughs> um, it can be someone who... I had an absolutely bizarre situation happen to me and someone said, you know, you're supposed to help us. It's like, what? How, what do you mean I'm supposed to help you? You're the one, you're supposed to help us. It's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, I understand that now. I didn't understand it, you know, in the, in the late eighties. So you evolve. If you choose to embrace your job, which you didn't realize you were going to have, then you follow a very specific pathway that's not an easy path. It's following the spiritual path sometimes is like walking, you know, through a minefield in an earthquake and a thunderstorm. You need to place your feet very carefully. Absolutely. I could talk to you for so many more hours and I would love to have you back on the show to even I, I would guess, love to come back yeah we could dive deeper and deeper into these subjects all day but it's been so illuminating for me to have this conversation I can't wait to go back and listen to it and digest everything and take in everything that you said and I'm sure my listeners will probably listen to this a couple of times as well but I have to ask you because I asked this question to all my guests since the show is called Shifting Dimensions. Have you shifted in perspective on anything recently? It could be as lighthearted as you want it to be or as deep as you would like it to be. Have I shifted? I have become far more aware of the differences in light and dark and the power of prayer. It's one of these things, I mean, it's not like I haven't written 
I've written over a hundred prayers. I have a book published, you know, crossing over prayer book. What happens with prayer is it is an energy. All thought is energy. It's a physics concept. When you're sending prayer, when you're communicating with the higher realms on behalf of someone else, like all the people in Western North Carolina, I mean, there's just thousands of prayer hours going to them. It changes things. It changes people on the subtlest levels. The, the metaphysics of it can't see that prayer, but prayer travels with the speed of thought. It's not, it's faster than an email. It's faster than a text. It comes from your heart and the more you're sending it, the higher your frequency connects you to the higher realms. That is a fabulous place to be. So if I could leave your listeners with that, when you pray, and Christ was once asked about that, he said, the prayer that comes from your heart that you create, and you can use the ones that I created, that'd be awesome. But in Christ's words, the prayer that you create from your heart that you send to someone else with unconditional love is the most powerful prayer and anyone can do it. And really understanding that at a higher level, that's a major shift in dimensional thinking. Yes, that was that was powerful. And I, and I have to ask, because I'm curious, it, is prayer, I know what prayer is, I've prayed, and I think I'm trying to figure out a new structure of praying for me. That's a whole journey, personal journey. I'll figure out myself, not on the podcast. But is prayer an intention that you're kind of saying out loud or saying in your mind? Yes, but it's more than that. A prayer is, and it depends on the kind of prayer, um, prayer where you ask that someone change to accommodate your will is black prayer. It's, it's not a good prayer. Prayer that wants something for another person they don't want for themselves, that's not a good prayer. Prayer that wants something from someone they don't have a capacity to give, not a good prayer. But prayer that sends love and compassion and asks for help for another person in a karmically correct way is a karmically correct prayer. Where you address God, you state the problem, you make the request and you send gratitude. Those four steps are, are the building blocks of any prayer and it changes you. The more you pray or you send those prayers or you read them, or you pray them, all, all the prayers in the Crossing Over Prayer Book are on Audible. So a lot of people just walk through graveyards and say the prayer and just play it. You're doing a service you wouldn't have anticipated you were doing. I mean, for the people, whether it's in Roswell, New Mexico, that have floods, or Nepal had massive floods, or Austria had floods, and Western North Carolina and Florida, I mean, let's just take what happened in Lahaina or Acapulco. All of these disasters, all of these people, you can only send so much money. And then what do you send? When you send the energy of prayer to people you don't know, you are sending the energy of hope. And in some moment, that's going to benefit somebody. You don't have to know who it is. But there's going to be a gratitude that comes back in a universal way, and you're going to know it and it will change you mm. if that's any help at all. Yes. Tina, thank you so much for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Where can people find you if they want to get the crossing over prayer, if they want to learn more about you or purchase any of your books? Thank you for that opportunity. It's ghosthelpers.com, ghosthelpers with an S.com. And all the books are there. And the book of prayers is the Crossing Over Prayer book. And it has 88 prayers that help the living and the dead for someone with cancer, a child dies, somebody has a miscarriage or an abortion. What prayer are you going to say? How can you help that person? And that's really, that's really the goal. How do we help in the best way, in the most karmically correct way possible? And on that website, there are many prayers that are there for free. Anyone can say them, you can just play them. And if that's a service to you, then I, it, you know, I am deeply grateful for anyone who uses those prayers. And uh, 
when you cross someone over, it is the compassion you will want for yourself. So I, I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to share some, maybe some unconventional thoughts. No, I appreciate you so much. Thank you again for stopping by the show. Thank you so much for having me.